So for the past 20 years, I've been working with women that have been struggling with the trappings of poverty. One in three adult women are living in poverty or on the edge of poverty. In 1998, I launched Dress for Success Midwest, which is, many of you know, is a nonprofit that provides professional attire for women to land jobs. So you can imagine over the years, all the different women that I've met, and every, all the stories, it's been incredible, women from homelessness to domestic violence, and women that are coming out of prison. But there's one woman that sticks out, and that's the very first woman that I helped. Her name was Bridget. It was a cold morning in February, and it was snowing, and I had a call to ask if I would help a young woman that had a job interview. Well, I was picking up my very first donation of suits. I was so excited, and I told them, you know, yes, but she had to meet me at the church parking lot. That's where I, I was located. So I picked up the suits, I got to the church, and I met Bridget. And we popped open the trunk of my car, and as you would know, there was a suit just her size. So we went inside, she put the suit on, and she walked out of the restroom. Her head was up, her shoulders were back, and I thought, she's confident. She looks great. She's ready to go for that job interview. Then I looked down at her shoes. She had tennis shoes on. I forgot all about shoes. And I thought, what am I going to do? She doesn't have, I don't have shoes. And all of a sudden, it just blurted out of my mouth. And I said, what size shoes do you wear? Like, I was really going to do something about the shoes, right? And she said, I wore, she wore size six, which is my size shoes. See these shoes? I just got those shoes. They were Nine West, Red Patent. I loved those shoes. So I had this dilemma going on. Give her your shoes. No! Give her your shoes. No! <laughs> and I felt like it went on forever. And I leaned down. I gave Bridget my shoes. And they fit. When she turned, she turned to the side. And she was looking in the mirror. And she had tears coming down. And I asked if she was OK. And she said, yes. And as she was walking towards the mirror, she had her hand out. And she told me, she said, you know what? I've never seen myself look like this. I have to touch the mirror to make sure that it's me. Bridget got in her car. She drove away feeling that confidence that she's never felt before. It was a real Cinderella moment. But you know what? Instead of a prince saving her, she saved herself. Two hours later, but this is the best part, two hours later, my phone rang. It was Bridget. She landed her job. It was great. So fast forward just like a little over a year, I received a call from the Department of Corrections asking if I would work with them with women that were transitioning out of prison. So I'm thinking, I don't know anything about women coming out of prison. But I said, I would, but I would like to go inside and talk to the women. So they made that possible. So as I was walking inside, and I remember thinking, yeah, I'm not going to be in there long. These women are tough. They're hard. They're heartless. What? They're not going to want to talk to me. Do they need a suit? I couldn't have been more wrong. The women began to share with me their dreams and what they wanted to do and how they wanted to go to school and get their education and the jobs they wanted to have. And some even wanted to start their own business. And then they began to talk about their children and how their children, they didn't want them to, to repeat the same cycle of poverty and then being in prison. But they didn't know what to do. They didn't have a plan. They didn't have connections. So after I left and I was walking out, I thought, what do they do? Well, I learned that a lot of women coming out of prison 
will go to a halfway house. So I contacted the local halfway house, and I asked the director if I could meet with her, so I did. She explained to me that many of the women, when they come there, they come in their prison uniform. They have to get a job in two weeks. Within 72 hours, they have to see their pr probation officer. And get this, they have to take a bus. So I sat there all amazed, and I just was overwhelmed because I was thinking about the women that I just left. Many of them have been in there a long time, and our world changes. So I asked her, I said, how do they do this? This is what she said. 85% of the women ask me to send them back to prison. That went straight to my heart. And I kept thinking, how would anybody want to go back to prison? And so what I did is I, that I started going inside. And I started going inside and working with women and helping them as they transitioned out. And I met a young woman, Maria. Maria was released to East St. Louis. Upon her release, she had no home, no money, no support system. But she had four children that were in foster care and were immediately given back into her custody. So I got some friends, volunteers together. We helped her to get into a hotel and then into a home, her children into school, and Maria a job. That was in 2001. Today, Maria's doing fantastic. She's doing so great. And all four of her children have graduated from high school. They've gone to college. And Maria has put herself through college. She also has advanced all the way up into an upper-level management position. And she has broken that cycle of poverty and incarceration, not only for herself, but for her children, which is huge. But as I was watching and seeing the women that were coming through Dress for Success, and over the years, we've served over 25,000 women. And seeing the women come through, I noticed something. And I learned something from Maria. They would come through, they would land their job. A few months later, they would come back around again. And I would ask them, I thought you had a job. They said, yeah, but I got a raise. In my world, a raise was good, right? They explained to me, for example, today, a single mom with one child making $11 an hour receives welfare benefits for assistance with transportation, help to pay the rent, and child care. We like to call them work supports. If she receives 25 cents more, look what happens. It stops. Could you pay for your child care alone at $11.25 an hour? plus transportation and your rent. So I started thinking about this, and I thought, what, what wage, what hourly wage would a single mom with one child have to make? Today and in this region, it would be around $21 an hour just to pay for her basic necessities. The system, our system, is set up my view, to create generations of poverty. Generations that are dependent versus independent and for people to live out the dreams that they have. So I really started thinking, how do we bridge this gap from that $11 an hour to the 21? The $11 an hour, you see it's on that cliff, right? That 25 cent raise, they fall off the cliff. So I knew they needed more than professional attire. What is it that they need? Career advancement, training, education, and sometimes you have to work a second job. But you know what else I learned? It's right here in this room. They needed connections. They needed to have what you all have, what I have. 
Think about how today and with your job, how did you get into your job or your business? Through a network, right? Through somebody you knew that helped you, you had a connection. The women that walk through our doors have no network. They have no net. So think about the networking events that you've been to. Probably this week, and you, you know, today is a great example of a networking event, right? So you go, and sometimes I know we drag ourselves there. We drink the warm Chablis, right? We have to balance our purse. Then we have food on our plate. Then we have to shake a hand. And then we talk to people that we, we really don't know. And sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes we wonder if it is. But what if no one wanted to talk to you ever? I thought about that. I thought about the women that were walking through our doors. I thought about the Marias and the Bridgets, and I kept thinking about them. So I started a professional women's networking group. And thinking about how we network, and you know, it is awkward for us, right? But we do it and we get by. But so many of the women didn't know how to give eye contact. How do you shake a hand? How do you present yourself? And then how do you start a conversation? So we would practice all of these things together. And then I thought, let's go on a field trip. So I would seek out other networking events, and we would take the women. I would take them, and we would go. And it was so fun. I would watch them mingle and talk. And at the end of the evening, they were so excited. They were excited to share how they connected with other women and how some of them even were connected with jobs. But the biggest thing is they learned the power of networking, of being connected to other women. It was amazing. You know, we put a lot of pressure on women. We ask them to rise up, stand up, do it all on your own. The fact is, none of us would be here today, right, on our own? None of us can do this thing called life on our own. We need each other. So we can and should support the progress of all women and be supportive, but especially those that are on that edge of poverty. You see, right here in this room, all of you right here, you're the rising tide. And you know what? You can lift all boats. This is really personal to me. Not because I launched the nonprofit and not because of the work I do. But because 32 years ago, when I was 26, I picked myself up off the floor. I walked out of a bad marriage. I walked out the door with the clothes on my back, $5 in my pocket. I was homeless. I was afraid. I was embarrassed. I was so scared. You see, it was a time no one ever talked about leaving. And there weren't any shelters for women. But I was a lucky one because in my other pocket, <laughs> I had a piece of paper that through a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend gave me the name of a person and number and said if I ever needed anything to call. So when I left, I went to a phone booth I called that number, and Rachel answered the phone. When she heard my voice, she heard me. She said, come. So I did. I went. And she opened up her home to me. I slept on her couch. I ate her food. She gave me hope. And within a few weeks, I had a job interview. <laughs> And I didn't have anything to wear, but I had my $5. So I went to the local thrift store, and I remember so vividly even today, I bought this gray skirt 
this turquoise button-up sweater and black pumps. And I was ready to go for my job interview. And you know what? I did, and I landed my job as a receptionist. <laughs> I started my life over, and I started it over because of Rachel being there and being connected. So my wish for all of you today, my wish for all of you is to remember the women that may be right next to you and to remember them and to reach out to them and also that remember that no one person can break that cycle of poverty. But you know what? Together, oh yeah, <laughs> together, we can be that rising tide, and we can. It's up to us. Thank you.